Bienvenue officiellement au premier forum des Amis des parcs de Montréal. Au nom des partenaires, on vous souhaite la bienvenue. Le premier forum des Amis des parcs de Montréal est organisé par les Amis des parcs en collaboration avec les Amis de la montagne et en partenariat avec le Centre d'écologie urbaine de Montréal et le Conseil régional en environnement de Montréal. Il s'inscrit dans la programmation de mai, mois du Mont-Royal, conçue par les Amis de la montagne et réalisée annuellement en partenariat avec la Ville de Montréal. L'événement est généreusement financé par la Banque TD et le secrétariat à la région métropolitaine du ministère des Affaires municipales et de l'Habitation du Québec. C'est un plaisir de vous avoir avec nous aujourd'hui. Avant de poursuivre dans l'événement, j'aimerais offrir officiellement, euh, ou, pardon, j'aimerais ouvrir officiellement cette conférence en reconnaissant cette terre où nous sommes réunis et en exprimant notre gratitude pour son lien étroit à notre santé à tous. Nous reconnaissons la présence durable et la résilience des peuples des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis sur ce territoire, ainsi que leur rôle de pourvoyeur, de soins, de protecteur et de compteur partout sur l'île de la Tortue. Nous reconnaissons la nation gagnon comme gardienne des terres et des eaux de Montréal, ou Jojage, où nous sommes rassemblés aujourd'hui. Ce territoire non cédé a longtemps servi de lieu de rassemblement et d'échange entre les nations. Nous sommes honorés de pouvoir réunir ce groupe d'amis des parcs aujourd'hui, car nous croyons que les parcs devraient jouer un rôle vital dans nos efforts pour offrir des espaces que tous les peuples peuvent partager et qu'ils sont des espaces essentiels à la réconciliation et à la décolonisation. Nous vous invitons à vous engager comme nous à la protection de ce territoire comme le font les peuples autochtones depuis des temps immémoriaux, et à mieux comprendre l'histoire de la colonisation et les façons dont la vérité et la réconciliation peuvent nous aider à amener tout le monde sur un terrain d'entente. Merci. Alors, entrons dans le vif du sujet, le pouvoir des parcs urbains. Donc, le premier forum des Amis des parcs de Montréal, euh, on a choisi pour cet événement de parler du pouvoir des parcs urbains. Plus que jamais, nous avons bien remarqué à quel point les parcs urbains sont essentiels. En fait, à Montréal, c'est plus de 1200 parcs de quartier, dont 20 parcs métropolitains et parcs nature, qui couvrent environ 11 du territoire. C'est un pourcentage qui pourrait être augmenté quand on sait que plus de 60 des Montréalais n'ont pas accès à une cour. À Montréal, euh, il y a déjà plusieurs initiatives formelles et informelles qui existent autour des parcs urbains, mais certains aspects de ces initiatives sont très peu documentés. Euh, C'est pourquoi plusieurs partenaires se sont unis pour créer le premier réseau des Amis des parcs de Montréal. Et c'est avec grand plaisir que nous lançons aujourd'hui ce réseau. Euh, le forum est la première activité officielle du réseau des Amis des parcs de Montréal. Et le réseau a comme mission, en fait, euh, que tous les Montréalaises et Montréalais aient accès à un parc de proximité qui réponde à leurs besoins. Pour ce faire, le réseau appuiera et documentera les efforts des acteurs des parcs de Montréal, des groupes de bénévoles, des organisations à but non lucratif, des associations de résidents et des professionnels des parcs. Le réseau aidera à renforcer leurs capacités, à augmenter leur impact et contribuera au développement d'un mouvement soutenant le pouvoir des parcs municipaux à Montréal au cours des prochaines années. Le réseau des Amis des parcs de Montréal, c'est un projet de partenariat. Il y a euh, quatre... Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien, tout le monde? J'ai l'impression qu'on me dit que peut-être euh, le son n'est pas... Euh... Je, vais, je vais tenter de parler lentement. Donc, je disais que le réseau est un projet de partenariat. Euh, vous avez euh, quatre... Euh, euh, en fait, euh, les quatre logos ici sont les quatre... Euh, représentent les quatre organismes partenaires euh, qui présenteront aujourd'hui euh, leur contribution au projet. Donc, euh, le réseau est un, est un, est un, a uni ces quatre organisations-là et on est très heureux euh, qu'ils soient avec nous, euh, les représentants. Donc, je vais passer la parole tout de suite à Mme Nathalie Brown, des Amis des parcs, euh, qui est directrice de programme euh, chez, euh, chez les Amis des parcs. Bonjour Nathalie, la parole est en toi. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. C'est pour moi un honneur d'être présent ici pour le lancement du réseau des Amis des parcs de Montréal en tant que représentant des Amis des parcs. Les Amis des parcs est un organisme caritatif qui soutient et mobilise la population afin d'activer le pouvoir des parcs dans les villes du Canada. 
Le réseau des amis des parcs de Montréal vient concrétiser le travail de recherche et de mobilisation sur le terrain de l'équipe montréalaise des amis des parcs. Depuis 2018, nous avons accompagné plus de 35 groupes montréalais documenter le travail de la Ville de Montréal dans notre rapport annuel canadien sur les parcs urbains et distribuer plus de 70 bourses TV à des parcs aux groupes qui souhaitent organiser des activités pour leur communauté dans leur parc de quartier. Le réseau permet de créer une mobilisation en faveur des parcs urbains encore plus grande grâce à une concertation avec nos partenaires formidables. J'ai hâte d'assister à ce forum avec vous, d'apprendre davantage sur les enjeux et les opportunités qui nous attendent et de faciliter les échanges de bonnes pratiques et le partage d'inspiration à travers le Canada. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Nathalie. Euh, je vais maintenant passer la parole à la directrice générale de, du Centre d'écologie urbaine de Montréal, Mme Véronique Fournier. Bonjour, Véronique. Bonjour. Je suis très enthousiaste euh, au lancement aujourd'hui à la création là, du réseau euh, des Amis des parcs euh, de Montréal. Euh, C'est un travail... Euh, euh, sur lesquels on, on, on avance depuis plusieurs mois, voire plusieurs années, et qui prend euh, tout son sens, euh, notamment là, avec la situation euh, qu'on vit dans la dernière année et l'importance euh, des parcs urbains dans nos euh, collectivités. Euh, ça fait 25 ans que le Centre d'écologie urbaine a la conviction que les citoyens et les professionnels peuvent agir pour transformer la ville et créer des milieux de vie à échelle humaine. C'est pourquoi euh, nous sommes engagés avec les partenaires pour dessiner qu'est-ce qui pourrait être un réseau des Amis des parcs à la Montréalaise en s'appuyant sur la base de la citoyenneté active qui est bien présente dans nos quartiers, mais également aussi cette volonté qui est euh, bien visible dans les villes de se réapproprier l'espace public, euh, dont les parcs. Euh, le centre d'écologie dans le réseau va agir en ayant un rôle structurant au plan des partenariats, de la collaboration, euh, de la gestion et du financement, ainsi que le développement des capacités des communautés. Et on souhaite bien sûr pouvoir mettre à profit euh, notre, nos expériences et notre expertise pour le développement de parcs euh, et espaces verts euh, à échelle humaine, tant euh, à Montréal euh, qu'ailleurs au Québec. Donc, euh, avec ce réseau qui émerge, euh, je pense que la, la, la force de cette nouvelle collaboration, ça va être bien sûr l'échange des bonnes pratiques, s'aider à être meilleur euh, ensemble, euh, tant à l'échelle hyper locale des parcs de quartier également dans un partage de pratiques à l'échelle canadienne pour ultimement le multiplier l'impact qu'on souhaite avoir comme citoyen et communauté sur les parcs urbains. Alors, longue vie à ce réseau qui prend forme officiellement aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, Véronique Fournier. Euh, je vais maintenant passer la parole à Mme Hélène Panayotti, qui est directrice générale au, chez les Amis de la Montagne. Hélène, merci. Alors, merci Caroline. On est ravis d'être ici aujourd'hui. Les Amis de la Montagne sont un OVNL qui est engagé dans la protection et la mise en valeur du Mont-Royal depuis ben, 35 ans cette année. Il est tout naturel pour nous de participer à la fondation du réseau des Amis des parcs de Montréal, alors que nous privilégions depuis nos débuts la concertation de la communauté et des décideurs publics autour d'une vision commune pour la gestion durable de la montagne, donc du Mont-Royal. La concertation est vraiment dans notre ADN et euh, ce réseau est l'occasion, euh, c'est une occasion unique pour nous de partager notre expérience et notre expertise, mais également d'en apprendre plus d'autres euh, parcs et d'autres membres du réseau et d'innover avec vous. Alors, c'est donc avec enthousiasme que nous accueillons la perspective d'accompagner de nouveaux groupes euh, pour développer le plein potentiel des parcs de Montréal. Dans ce contexte, euh, les Amis de la Montagne sont euh, convaincus euh, de, de l'importance du modèle ville et OBNL Amis des parcs pour réaliser le plein potentiel des parcs. Et les premiers qui sont avantagés sont les citoyens, donc des familles, des amis, des solistes qui gravitent vers des espaces publics verdoyants qui leur font tant de bien. D'ailleurs, on a très, très hâte d'entendre de parler M. Adrien Bénépé et également Mme Boucher à ce sujet. Donc, au nom de tous les Amis de la montagne, euh, je vous souhaite un premier forum des amis euh, des parcs de Montréal riche en apprentissage 
et un réseautage. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Hélène Panayotti. Et maintenant, je vais passer la parole à M. Emmanuel Rondia, directeur général du Conseil régional de l'environnement de Montréal. Emmanuel, merci. Merci, Caroline. Bonjour à toutes et tous. C'est en effet une très belle journée pour les parcs montréalais, pour tous les, les usagers et les utilisateurs de ces, de ces espaces qui font la fierté de la ville. Euh, on est très heureux, le Conseil régional de l'environnement, d'être partenaire de cette belle aventure avec, euh, avec les autres organisations. On voit le, tout l'intérêt que suscitent les parcs euh, en simplement en regardant euh, le, la, la participation à cet événement aujourd'hui. Déjà plus de 120 personnes euh, pour cette conférence. Euh, C'est sûr, le, CRE, le Conseil régional de l'environnement, on est un, un organisme de bienfaisance euh, qui agit comme instance de concertation d'environnement sur l'île de Montréal. Euh, depuis plus de 25 ans maintenant, on milite euh, entre autres pour un accès euh, équitable aux parcs et aux espaces verts pour l'ensemble de la population montréalaise. Euh, et on le fait en fédérant euh, les forces euh, vives de la société civile, en participant à des instances de concertation en lien avec les parcs et les espaces verts. On a établi euh, des liens forts aussi avec un grand nombre de partenaires, euh, dont euh, les partenaires autour de la table, euh, autour de l'écran aujourd'hui euh, dans, dans le cadre du réseau. Euh, et euh, à plus large échelle aussi, on est impliqué euh, entre autres dans le mouvement ceinture verte qui vise la création d'une grande ceinture euh, verte à l'échelle de la région du Grand Montréal. Donc, euh, une diversité d'interventions à différentes échelles aussi, je pense que c'est une, une des clés du succès. Euh, c'est sûr, comme organisme de concertation, on est convaincu de la force du réseau aussi. Euh, ça permet de ne pas se sentir seul, d'avoir accès à des expertises, des ressources. Puis c'est vraiment euh, une des, un des éléments clés en fait, du réseau des Amis des Parcs, je pense, qui va venir répondre à un besoin, euh, euh, un besoin de la société, un besoin des groupes citoyens, un besoin, euh, un besoin aussi des administrations de travailler ensemble pour euh, mettre en valeur et, euh, et euh, profiter au, au maximum de nos espaces verts. Parce qu'on l'a vu, c'est sûr, dans le cadre de la pandémie, le, le besoin d'accès de nature, euh, de proximité est vraiment criant. Euh, qui plus est dans une perspective d'adaptation au changement climatique aussi, où on sait tous le, le, les bienfaits en fait, qu'apportent euh, autant euh, les parcs, les espaces verts et le contact à la nature sur notre santé euh, physique et euh, psychique. Euh, concrétiser l'objectif d'avoir des parcs accessibles par, partout et pour tous, c'est un, un beau défi. Euh, ça va passer par une diversité d'actions euh, qui, qui vont aller de la création de nouveaux parcs, la protection d'espaces verts, la mise en valeur des parcs existants aussi et l'amélioration de, de leur accessibilité. Puis c'est un chantier, je pense, qui va se faire avec euh, l'ensemble de la collectivité. Puis c'est dans cette perspective que le CRUB est très heureux de mettre à profit à la fois son expertise de concertation, sa connaissance du territoire, son réseau diversifié de partenaires, sa capacité de diffusion aussi pour favoriser le déploiement du réseau des Amis des Parcs de Montréal. Puis je vais reprendre la formule de Véronique, mais longue vie aux Amis des Parcs. Oui, merci beaucoup Emmanuel Rondia et merci à, à tous les, les, les représentants de nos quatre organismes partenaires. C'est vraiment motivant de vous entendre. Merci. On va maintenant passer à un mot de la mairesse de Montréal qui, grâce à la magie de l'Internet, sera avec nous. Donc, je vais arrêter mon partage d'écran afin de vous repartager un vidéo inédit de la mairesse. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. C'est avec un grand plaisir que je me joins à vous pour l'ouverture du tout premier Forum des Amis des Parcs de Montréal. Cet événement marque la création du réseau des Amis des Parcs de Montréal, une création qui va non seulement favoriser l'appropriation de nos parcs locaux, mais aussi leur protection et leur mise en valeur. Les espaces verts font partie de l'ADN de Montréal. Nous avons pu constater durant la dernière année à quel point les parcs urbains contribuent à la qualité de vie de la population. Nos espaces verts et nos parcs dans tous les quartiers de la ville sont essentiels à notre bonheur individuel et collectif. Nous devons donc les protéger et les multiplier. Et pour ça, il faut mettre la biodiversité et les espaces verts au centre de nos décisions. Il faut enraciner la nature en ville. C'est précisément ce que notre administration fait. Nous venons d'ailleurs de lancer il y a quelques jours le plan Nature et Sport. Ce plan ambitieux et innovant encourage les communautés à adopter un style de vie sain et actif. Les espaces verts se retrouvent au cœur de notre quotidien. Ils offrent aux Montréalaises et aux Montréalais des espaces de proximité pour se divertir, se rencontrer, se dépenser et s'évader. Ce sont des lieux vivants et attractifs qui contribuent à la santé sociale, physique et mentale de la population. 
L'accès à des parcs de qualité doit demeurer équitable sur l'ensemble du territoire de l'île. C'est une priorité pour notre administration et nous y travaillons activement, tout en protégeant la biodiversité et la qualité de notre environnement. Nos objectifs sont ambitieux. C'est pourquoi je me réjouis d'assister aujourd'hui à la naissance et au lancement du réseau des Amis des parcs qui pourra les soutenir. Cette alliance pourra faire une véritable différence dans la communauté au cours des prochaines années. Je vous dis donc bravo et bon forum! Donc voilà le mot de la mairesse, plusieurs mots d'honneur et je vais repartager mon écran euh, ici, je pense, voilà, pour maintenant euh, passer au euh, contenu principal de notre, euh, de notre activité d'aujourd'hui, soit notre conférence d'honneur, comment activer le pouvoir des parcs urbains. Donc, nos deux invités aujourd'hui, on a un programme double, mettront en évidence les multiples valeurs des parcs et euh, l'importance de leur gouvernance en partenariat et les besoins des populations qui les utilisent au quotidien. Ces deux conférenciers passionnés mettront en valeur l'étendue des bénéfices que les parcs urbains offrent aux communautés et aux villes. Donc, M. Benepi parlera pendant 40 minutes, il sera sous peu présenté, et Mme Nathalie Boucher parlera pendant 15 minutes. Il y aura ensuite une période de questions qui suivra la présentation de Mme Nathalie Boucher et qui concernera les deux présentations. Donc, vous pouvez, pendant les présentations, commencer à écrire vos questions dans l'outil Q&A ou Q&A. Et dans cet outil, on vous, on vous invite à écrire vos questions et à préciser à qui vous posez la question, si c'est à un conférencier en particulier. Donc, ne pas utiliser la fenêtre de clavardage pour les questions. Vous pouvez les écrire directement dans l'outil des questions. Et vous pouvez aussi voter pour des questions que vous trouvez intéressantes, que vous n'auriez euh, pas su écrire mieux. Donc, voilà. Et, à, et maintenant, pour euh, présenter notre premier conférencier, M. Euh, Adrienne Benepi, je vais passer la parole à Mme Violaine Pronovo, qui est la directrice régionale de la Fondation TD des Amis de l'Environnement. Violaine, la parole est à vous. Merci, Caroline. Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, ben dans un premier temps, félicitations pour euh, ce nouveau réseau Amis des parcs de Montréal. Euh, comme ça l'a déjà été dit, je sais qu'il y a énormément de travail en arrière de ça. Ça fait déjà un certain temps que je sais que l'équipe fourmillait euh, pour essayer de mettre ça en place. Il y a tellement de belles collaborations autour de ça. Puis clairement, ben, c'est gage de plein de beaux projets à venir. Donc, euh, longue vie au réseau des parcs. Donc, pour moi, bien sûr, c'est un plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui pour faire le pont vers la conférence d'honneur qui a pour titre « Comment activer le pouvoir des parcs urbains? » Car oui, les parcs ont un pouvoir immense, comme vous le savez sûrement, et que vous allez l'apprendre davantage dans les prochaines minutes, puisqu'ils sont plus qu'essentiels à la santé et la résilience de nos collectivités. C'est pourquoi la Banque TD s'est engagée à soutenir le déploiement, l'amélioration et l'animation de parcs urbains partout à travers le pays. Ça se traduit notamment par notre engagement auprès de l'organisme Park People, ami des parcs, depuis maintenant dix ans. Plus près de nous, la TD contribue depuis le début, en 2018, à l'émergence des activités de l'organisme au Québec. Que ce soit via les bourses TD Amis des parcs ou encore le financement qu'on octroie euh, via la Fondation TD des Amis de l'Environnement ou des dons corporatifs, nous aspirons à contribuer à dynamiser et à verdir les parcs mais aussi à appuyer la collaboration et la participation citoyenne qui va assurer leur plein déploiement. Sans plus tarder, je vais vous présenter le conférencier invité d'aujourd'hui, que j'ai d'ailleurs eu la chance de rencontrer lors du Forum Amis des parcs de 2017, tenu à Calgary. Donc, Adrian Benepi est l'actuel président du Jardin botanique de Brooklyn. Il a été le vice-président senior et directeur des programmes nationaux pour The Trust for Public Lands, et ancien commissaire au service des parcs et loisirs de la ville de New York de 2002 à 2012. Pendant ce dernier mandat, il a supervisé une expansion majeure du réseau des parcs de la ville de New York en instaurant une culture de collaboration entre les groupes citoyens, la ville et le secteur privé. Il possède une perspective inspirante sur la valeur de cette collaboration pour une planification et une gestion d'un réseau des parcs adapté aux besoins de la communauté et aux responsabilités de l'administration municipale. La parole est à vous, Adrian. Merci beaucoup, euh, Violaine. Est-ce que Adrienne… Oui, bonjour, Adrienne. 
Oui, bonjour. Euh, maintenant, il faut que je, je partage mon écran. Exactement. Vous pouvez m'entendre, bon. vous? Oui. Voilà. Et voilà. Donc, euh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Euh, je suis honoré de prendre la parole à ce forum. Mais comme je ne, je ne parle pas couramment le français, je parlerai en anglais et je salue les traducteurs. Bon, on y va. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to you um, a little bit about the, the, um, the context in which we live today around the world. And I would put forward the proposition that this is the golden age of parks. And what do I mean by that? Um, First, let's think about some of the great parks of the world. Uh, obviously, Central Park. Um, you know, we are we are in the third. I would argue that we are in the third great era of park creation in the United States, and it's really a global golden age of new park creation, as urbanization increases and cities compete with each other for residential, commercial, and tourism revenue. So really the first great park, first great public park in North America is Central Park, was the first purpose-built public park and its creation and in the 1860s and its restoration in the 1980s were really bellwethers for urban parks in the United States and North America. The High Line uh, would represent part of this new golden age Um, as many of you know, it was an old elevated freight line built in the 1920s and no longer in use by the 1980s. It was set to be demolished, but a neighborhood activist group founded by Joshua, David, and Robert Hammond in 1993 helped to save it and to imagine a reuse as a public park. The rest, as they say, is history. It is still overseen by a non-profit organization called the Friends of the High Line today. And there is no... Par, uh, cet organisme à but non lucratif qui s'appelle Friends of the High Line. Et le parc bénéficie, ne bénéficie d'aucun financement public pour son fonctionnement. Uh, ses objectifs ont été... Art, it is walking, there are gardens, and um, a, a very important new model for urban revitalization. But it's not just in big cities like New York that this is taking place. One of the biggest privately funded park creation projects is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the George Kaiser Family Foundation uh, has raised and spent about $400 million dollars to transform 100 acres of land along the Arkansas River into a 100 acre park. Um, Montreal is part of this. Uh, golden age of park creation. You have many fine parks, but uh, one of the most interesting is Frédéric Bach Park. Um, it is the, I would say, the equivalent of another major project happening in New York called Fresh Kills, which is the transformation of the world's largest garbage dump into a park. And this area, which used to be a limestone quarry, um, was transformed into the Saint Michel Environmental Complex. Uh, what I'm told is the biggest environmental rehabilitation project ever completed in the city of Montreal. And so Montreal is very much part of this global park creation movement. Another very important project model for what's happening around the world is in um, Madrid, the Rio project. The Manzanares River is a green space where they literally buried the highways that used to divide the people from the river's edge and built parks over them. Over 1 billion euros were invested and it took eight years of planning and construction to create 820 hectares of new parkland in the center of Madrid. This is an enormous scale of work that we see also replicated in London at Olympic Park, a former industrial brownfield, now a large green space that hosted the Olympics in 2012 and um, remains a successful park, which is very unlike the history of former Olympics grounds. Um, so this is one of the other trends we see in most cities, you do not have empty space to build new parks in. So the rehabilitation of former industrial areas 
shipping areas, um, infrastructure no longer in use, outmoded infrastructure has been the new frontier for park creation in cities around the world. <clears throat> and nowhere is this park development paradigm more in use than in, and at a larger scale than in China. In city after city, in scores of cities across uh, China, there are gigantic urban transformation projects going on. So for example, Tao, Tao Pu Central Park um, in Northwest Shanghai is a science and technology hub designed by James Corner Field Operations, one of the important landscape architecture firms. And it's not just a park because it um, bridges over a highway. It has land bridges and tunnels to allow for road infrastructure while having continu continuous park habitat and wildlife corridors. And it also functions as a way to process and manage stormwater runoff. So it functions as a very large green infrastructure system. <clears throat> so this is, this is another trend that we see mitigating the impacts of climate change and uh, using green infrastructure in the form of parks is another a major aspect of park development uh, around the world. So let us speak for a while about the superpower, the superpowers of parks. Uh, this is a, um, a slide that um, talks about the benefits of public parks and gardens. The Trust for Public Land, which is a national nonprofit organization where I worked for eight years after serving as New York City Parks Commissioner, led a national advocacy campaign aimed at mayors and other local political leaders. And we set as a goal that every resident of a city or other urban area in the US should have a high quality park within a 10 minute or a half. Une zone urbaine des États-Unis dispose d'un parc de qualité à moins de 10 minutes. Nous avons fait valoir que les parcs présentent de multiples avantages qui rendent les villes plus vivables et représentent un important retour sur investissement des fonds publics. Et vous pouvez voir tous ces avantages dans ce diagramme que nous avons appelé euh, Park Benefit Flower ou la fleur davantage des parcs ou des bienfaits des parcs. Si on arrive à, à atteindre tous ces objectifs, euh, on fera un grand pas pour, euh, en matière de santé publique. Et quand on peut présenter ces arguments aux maires, euh, souvent, ils voient vraiment l'intérêt de, de mettre en œuvre toutes ces, toutes ces activités. Euh, ensuite, je voudrais vous parler du fait que les parcs permettent de, de, de solidifier les collectivités. On ne peut pas avoir des parcs sans avoir des collectivités solides. L'un des arguments les plus convaincants que les parcs contribuent à créer des villes plus fortes est que pour créer de grands parcs, nous avons besoin de la forte participation du public. Donc, toutes ces images proviennent des projets de développement de parcs de Trust for Public Land, euh, lancés dans des villes des États-Unis. En haut à gauche, vous avez des élèves d'écoles publiques hein, dans le Bronx qui travaillent à la conception de leur parc. En haut à droite, des élèves de Newark qui montrent fièrement leur projet euh, pour le parc Mildred Helms. En bas à gauche, le jardin communautaire de Denver et en bas à droite, euh, le Santa Fe Railway Park et Plaza Santa Fe. Euh, sur cette diapositive, je voudrais parler des parcs et de la santé publique. Et l'argument que l'on présente souvent, c'est qu'on ne peut pas euh, atteindre... Euh, des hauts niveaux de santé publique sans avoir euh, des parcs euh, sains. Et il est important de démontrer euh, les bienfaits, les vertus euh, de, des parcs sur la santé publique. Euh, les parcs permettent de favoriser la santé environnementale. Euh, ça permet de, de réduire les îlots de chaleur. Et ça a des vertus aussi pour la santé physique et psychique. J'utilise dans cette diapositive le mot « inspiration » de manière large. Le développement des parcs est, est, a été au cœur des plans de développement de l'administration Bloomberg. 
euh, qui fait partie de, de, des villes euh, durables que le maire voulait créer. Et les parcs sont une structure, font partie intégrante des structures durables euh, du 21e siècle. Et vous avez la, la citation qui s'affiche à l'écran. Les parcs sont un élément crucial de l'infrastructure urbaine. Donc, le maire n'a pas simplement parlé de l'importance des parcs urbains, mais il a également investi euh, des millions de dollars euh, dans, sur 12 ans, qui est quelque chose d'extraordinaire. Ensuite, nous pouvons dire que les parcs sont, euh, font partie intégrante de l'économie locale. Ils jouent un rôle crucial. Si l'on crée un réseau de parcs euh, sains et on obtient un retour sur investissement euh, très intéressant, j'essaie de ne pas lire les mots sur l'écran, mais parce que je pense que vous pouvez tous les lire. Je voudrais euh, remercier les traducteurs qui ont traduit euh, ces diapositives. Avant, je vous ai parlé de l'importance écologique des parcs. Les parcs sont absolument remarquables sur ce qu'ils peuvent faire. Ils, apportent, ils absorbent le carbone, ils, ils attirent et retiennent les particules. Ils font office d'énormes éponges, de, des émissions de pollution. Ils, ils permettent aussi de nettoyer l'air et, et l'eau. Donc, ce, ceci constitue les super pouvoirs des parcs euh, et des environnements euh, du milieu naturel euh, en ville. Je vais maintenant parler du concept de partenariat. Euh, ce qui s'est passé ces 40 dernières années, surtout du Nord, pas vraiment dans d'autres pays, mais euh, aux États-Unis et au Canada, on a eu un développement des partenariats. On, on, les partenariats sont absolument essentiels, non seulement pour créer des parcs, mais aussi pour euh, maintenir leur pérennité et s'assurer qu'on ne qu qu s'engage pas dans, le, dans un déclin. Donc, ici, vous voyez une image qui montre le fonctionnement des partenariats pour les parcs de la ville de New York. Donc, euh, il s'agit de conservatoires de parcs ou d'organismes de conservation. Euh, le mot conservatoire ou organisme de conservation est simplement un terme pour dire que ce sont des organismes sans but lucratif. Donc, de, à gauche, ce sont euh, le, le secteur public euh, et à droite, ce sont des partenaires qui ont moins de moyens. Dans les centres-villes des villes, on voit souvent des partenariats, on voit des, des, lois, des, des ententes à long terme d'utilisation. Donc, la, prochaine, la, colonne, la deuxième colonne à gauche, ce sont la, la gestion privée avec des fonds publics. J'en parlerai un peu plus tard. Ensuite, nous avons des opérations hybrides conjointes. Donc, l'exemple de Brooklyn est un bon exemple. La plupart des services de nettoyage que la ville... Euh, propose et euh, faite en partenariat. Nous avons également euh, dans la colonne suivante le groupe des amis euh, qui s'occupe du fonctionnement. On a toutes les organisations que vous voyez. Et enfin, nous avons des ententes plus formelles, pardon, des, des, des partenariats non 
qui sont informelles avec euh, les amis des parcs, par exemple. Donc, il n'y a pas qu'un seul type de partenariat qui fonctionne. Il y a toute une gamme de collaborations euh, avec notamment les amis des parcs. Et ils ont tous leurs valeurs. À New York, où j'ai travaillé comme commissaire au parc pendant 12 ans, on voit différents types de partenariats euh, avec, euh, par exemple, le secteur public. Ici, on a euh, donc les niveaux municipaux, euh, municipal, l'État et le fédéral. Souvent, la ville reçoit des bourses ou des subventions pour ces parcs. Au milieu, vous avez les partenariats avec le secteur privé, par exemple, les concessions, euh, et donc euh, tous les services euh, fournis à la population, comme la, la restauration. Euh, la location de vélos, euh, la, la location de, de canaux. Euh, et donc, il loue généralement l'espace à la ville afin de fournir quelque chose, des biens ou des services à la population. Ensuite, nous avons euh, les partenariats euh, avec le secteur des organisations non euh, à but non lucratif. Ça peut être des organismes, euh, des associations pour euh, le soccer ou le, le baseball. Les partenariats avec les entreprises euh, permettent de fournir des services en échange de frais. Et ça permet, il y a aussi un retour pour les entreprises. Euh, C'est ce qui se passe aussi avec les conservatoires de parcs. Euh, ce sont des organismes qui travaillent de manière bénévole ou dans le cadre d'une entente. Parfois, ils reçoivent aussi de l'argent de la ville pour fournir des services. Ils, les, les, les partenariats permettent de fournir différentes ressources euh, que la ville ne pourrait pas fournir seule et ils comblent aussi des écarts lorsque les fonds publics baissent. Euh, les partenariats ne sont pas tous les mêmes. Euh, pendant la pandémie, euh, au moment où nous avions euh, le plus besoin des parcs, quand, quand euh, les, la plupart des commerces, des espaces étaient fermés, les budgets ont également baissé. Et cela a eu des conséquences euh, importantes. Parmi toutes les diapositives que je vais vous montrer. Les membres and making sure that the park always remains public. So if you recognize a private donor, you don't privatize the space. It's important to have some kind of a master plan for both the operating and the restoration of the park. You need a strong board of directors to help with raising money, advocating, utilizing their connections. It's always helpful if it's skilled at fundraising, but fundraising is not the most important aspect. Um, and park maintenance and programming responsibilities can be part of the responsibilities of a conservancy. Also important is the balance of the city and conservancy relationship, making sure that we, you understand who has what responsibilities. It's vital that there be community involvement in outreach and public programming Even if people can't give money, creating roles for volunteers is very important. Another rule I would say from having been involved with dozens of partnerships in New York City and around the country is that government represents the people and always has to have the final say. That's especially true on laws, rules, changes in land use, contracts, and major events. It's also true for security that the private 
you should leave the security to the public, um, the policing, the enforcement of rules and laws to public authorities, not to private. The single most important thing a government can do for a nonprofit partner is provide legal indemnification. What we call hold harmless agreements or legal coverage by government is crucial to make sure that a small nonprofit doesn't lose all its money because a tree falls on someone and there's a lawsuit and um, the, the private group is forced to pay out. Legal responsibility must rest with the city. And the final and most important fact is it's not the amount of money a partner group raises. It's the continued involvement of citizens in the life of the park over years and decades. So as elected officials come and go, you have a continuous presence of the representations of the neighborhood of the people who live in the community who will stay there even as uh, politicians come and go. Um, this page shows the names and logos of more than a dozen parks conservancies or friends groups in New York City. And together they raise and spend more than 220 million US dollars for parks in New York City. And to put that in context, that is on top of about $500 million in public funding for parks operations provided by the city of New York and another 300 million funds for construction. So it represents almost a 50% increase to the public budget with the private fundraising. And some of these are very big and some of them are very small, but they're all part of this ecosystem of partnerships. If we look at it nationally across the United States, as I mentioned, there are more than 15 park conservancies and there are hundreds of small neighborhood organizations helping with parks, but there are 15 major conservancies in New York and well more than 100 across the United States. Revenue, budget and scale varies from conservancy to conservancy. So based on numbers from 2009 to 2012, there's a very good report, which you can get from the Trust for Public Lands website. It's called Public Spaces, Private Money, The Triumphs and Pitfalls of Urban Park Conservancies. So in the most recent data, which is in also the Trust for Public Lands, City Park Facts, private spending by conservancies and other, and other nonprofits was more than $600 million across the United States. But you can see here that New York, which is so big and has so many parks and so many groups, represents more than a third of that total nationally. And here, just a couple of scales showing um, charts showing different parks organizations in cities big and small across the country and the, their total annual revenue. And these are old figures. This is probably almost 10 years ago. So you, you'd have to raise all these numbers, but the scale would remain pretty much the same with two groups in New York leading, but also very important um, uh, successful groups in cities like Detroit and St. Louis, Dallas, Houston, Pittsburgh, Buffalo. Uh, I would note that in Buffalo, two thirds of the park system is run by a, a small park conservancy, the Buffalo Olmsted Park Conservancy and so on. And going down, you see that some of them are really quite quite small and don't have a lot of money, but they all play important roles in their various parks. So the, um, you could say the mother of all park conservancies <laughs> or the grandmother literally is the Central Park Conservancy. In 1981, the Central Park Conservancy was created based on a model of cultural organizations, so like museums and universities and performing arts institutions, that there should be a board of citizens who helps to lead this park. This was a revolutionary idea at the time. Three um, people, two of whom are now dead, George Soros, Arthur Ross, and Richard Gilder, led an effort with Betsy Barlow Rogers, who was the first park administrator who invented the Central Park Conservancy. So just as with the original creation of Central Park, the Conservancy becomes a model and bellwether for scores of other similar organizations in New York City and across the US. And you can't replicate the Central Park Conservancy in every city because Central Park is surrounded by very tall buildings full of um, 
very wealthy people, many of whom are very generous. So when people say, can we imitate, can we replicate Central Park Conservancy in our city? I say, yes. If you have a large park surrounded by tall buildings full of generous millionaires and billionaires, you might be able to, but otherwise, let's look at other models. Um, and here you can see the, the mix of public and private that the, the park president and administrator report both to the parks commissioner and to a, a nonprofit board of trustees. And uh, here are some of the many projects that the Central Park Conservancy, which has its own landscape architecture department and it's got its monument maintenance department, it has its own gardeners. There are 80 gardeners assigned to Central Park. Here are many, a list of many of the projects that the Central Park Conservancy has overseen the, the reconstruction of this historic park. It, also oversees the day-to-day -day operations. And here you can see it employs more than 300 people. They're privately employed. They're not city employees. Responsible for horticulture, tree and turf care, trash management, statuary conservation, public programming, and much more. They have a zone management system with the park is split into 49 zones. Each is managed by a supervisor, a team. So you have a gardener who knows exactly what's going on in each zone. And then lots and lots of work by volunteers. They act as greeters, tour guides, and do a lot of pulling of weeds. <laughs> Most of the weeds are probably pulled by volunteers overseen by Central Park Conservancy staff. But it doesn't have to be a big famous park to have a good uh, partnership. Um, here are just a few facts and figures about Central Park. As you can see, it's big. It's um, Three, 350 hectares, 863 acres, a big, huge operating budget. Most of the money comes from charitable donations. They also have um, built quite a handsome endowment, $227 million in the endowment, which allows them to generate interest on that and pay for basic operations. Um, they also provide, the city provides an operating management agreement where they, they provide $8 million a year operating support. But that's about 15% of the overall cost of running the park. And they also give a small amount each year in city capital funds to rebuild walkways and infrastructure. But you don't have to be a giant park like Central Park to have an effective partnership. Here's a tiny park, just a little bit over six acres. Um, that's 1% the size of Central Park. It's less than 1%. But just as with Central Park, by the 1990s, it was in poor shape and not used by the local business community or the very few residents who then lived in Lower Midtown. So working with a nonprofit citywide parks group called the City Parks Foundation, local businesses, including some major corporations, worked to create a conservancy. They raised privately half the cost of restoring the park and the city did the other half. And they raised $5 million to give to a new conservancy to help endow its operations in the park. So effectively, they established a, an endowment with $5 million to help jumpstart the conservancy that takes care of this tiny but essential uh, park in the very crowded lower Midtown area of Manhattan. And you, here you can see some of the work that they do. Um, they engage with the community. It's particularly well known for its public artwork. And, and the upper left is a current exhibition by the famous uh, architect Maya Lin. It's about climate change. And it has a lot of dead trees. They brought in a lot of dead trees to underscore the need for sustainable parks and for parks to combat climate change. It has a popular dog run. And recently, they've been working to improve the habitat to attract pollinators like butterflies and also have um, harvest and mulch leaves to have a more holistic way of managing the park. Um, here, and here you can see they're working with the environment, harvesting and mulching leaves, top dressing plants, and protecting the local ecology. So no park is too small to play an important environmental role. I also uh, wanted to present um, the fact that it doesn't have to be a wealthy neighborhood surrounded by 
major corporations or wealthy residents to succeed. One of the most successful nonprofit partnerships in New York City's history is that of the Bronx River Alliance. Um, it has done a lot of work, as you can see here. It, it has its roots in environmental justice advocates who are working to remove terrible industrial waste and community waste, abandoned cars, washing machines from the river. It's really an open sewer. And it's, it's the only freshwater river in all of New York City. The rest of the rivers in New York City are tidal estuaries, salt water. And then these environmental justice groups came together in 2001, 20 years ago, as a consortium of community-based environmental justice groups and formed this alliance to protect the river for environment, for education, for the economy and community. And alongside the river are about 700 uh, for acres of paths. I will note that the river flows through the poorest congressional district in the United States. And they were particularly successful at raising public dollars, at bringing in almost $200 million to um, rebuild the park. And here you can see they have an ecology team, scientists and organizations working to improve the health of the river, a greenway team designing, um, working to design and implement bicycle paths and pedestrian paths along the entirety of the, of the river. Doing education, the river is used as a way to introduce children from the neighborhood to ecology. Outreach programs, one of the most fun things you can do is canoe the Bronx River. Every year they have a flotilla where people canoe the entire river or ride on bicycles along its length. And it goes about seven miles through the Bronx into the Long Island Sound. And here you can see some of the scale of operations. So this is from the most recent annual report. And here you can see one of the crews working in the river to clean it. You can see what they've done. Um, it was a modest year, 1.2 million in public support for their work. Um, and the rest was privately funded. But I will tell you that they worked with local elected officials, including council member Jose Serrano, to bring in about $200 million in public funding, federal, city, and state public funding, transportation funding. So the, the principal source of funding to revive this entire riverfront was from public money, but it was done through advocacy by this local community. Without their advocacy, none of this would have happened. So at the end of the day, conservancies and parks are really about people. And if I leave you with one fact, it's that community involvement is more important than all the financial contributions, which are still important. They're the most important thing. The community involvement is the most important thing we can do to have successful park partnerships. And um, on that note, I will um, end my presentation and look forward to having some questions and look forward to the next presentation. Merci à tous. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Benepi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Benepi. Normally, we would have a round of applause, uh, right? Um, C'est définitivement très intéressant de, de se promener, de comprendre um, des dynamiques aussi qui sont uh, propres aussi peut-être, uh, bon, qui sont internationales à certains égards. International in some ways, but uh, that are... Aux dynamiques américaines ou aux États-Unis. Et puis... American notre... or American environments. Our second presenter will uh, bring us back to Montreal. And uh, we will be noting the questions that uh, arose for Mr. Benepi, and we are going to get back to them. At, à l'instant, donc, euh, juste un instant, voilà, je partage mon écran. Donc, euh, Nathalie Boucher euh, se joint à nous aujourd'hui. Euh, C'est vraiment un plaisir de l'avoir avec nous. Euh, elle est anthropologue, spécialiste des espaces publics euh, euh, urbains. Son parcours professionnel l'a amené à travailler à l'Andhra Pradesh, en Inde, à Mastoyash, à Mitasiman, en passant par Managa, au Nicaragua. Lors de l'observation des espaces publics et des échanges qui s'y déroulent, elle s'inspire de la géographie sociale, de l'anthropologie, de la communication et de la sociologie urbaine. 
Elle adore discuter méthodologie et réfléchir sur l'humain des villes et c'est pourquoi elle a enseigné ces matières, notamment à l'INRS, et publié sur ces sujets. Directrice et chercheure de l'organisme Respire, elle a un faible pour le parc Jean-Drapeau au centre du fleuve Saint-Laurent pour ses contrastes entre foule et solitude, passé et présent, ville et nature. C'est un plaisir de vous avoir avec nous, Nathalie. Donc, euh, la parole et euh, l'écran est à vous. Merci. Bonjour, merci. J'ai voulu être stratégique en partageant mon écran avant d'ouvrir mon micro. C'était une erreur. Alors, merci beaucoup. Merci. C'est un honneur vraiment de, de, de faire partie de ce grand événement en l'honneur des parcs de Montréal et du réseau qui, qui, va, les, qui va les soutenir. Euh, <coughs> Je vous invite à un voyage euh, euh, différent, mais complémentaire à celui euh, de M. Banépi. Euh, ma lunette à moi, comme euh, l'a présenté Caroline, c'est celle euh, de l'anthropologue. Euh, et donc, euh, ce que je regarde dans les parcs, c'est la, la culture, comment elle se déploie dans les parcs. Et euh, la culture, je, je comprends euh, que c'est euh, tout le système de valeurs, les croyances et les mythes et les connaissances partagées. Euh, entre... Shared knowledge that we have within a group. That is really my lens. I am um, uh, also a user of Park, but I've uh, used Parks in different capacities oui mais euh, jusqu'à jusqu'à tout récemment mais franchement dans dans, dans, dans mon dans ma vie professionnelle j'ai été amenée à observer les gens qui les utilisent et et, et c'est là mon coup de foudre euh, c'est c'est tout le balai c'est pas une expression de moi vous le saurez de, de personnes qui se déplacent et qui 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 s'entendent alors que ce sont des purs inconnus pour utiliser un espace qui est offert à eux euh, ça me fascine euh, depuis très longtemps et ça me permet aussi de, de, de mettre des, des noms ou des, des, de qualifier des expériences pour certains usagers ou certaines usagères comme j'étais moi-même adolescente ou comme le sont euh, les, les filles sur l'image prise au parc Laurier euh, <coughs> et aussi à qualifier euh, euh, bon, des, la qualité de certains bancs de parc par exemple ici et ailleurs. Euh, mais euh, euh, c'est donc un, un plaisir pour moi de, de, de vous partager euh, ce, que, ce, que, ce sur quoi je travaille depuis plus de 20 ans. <coughs> Excusez-moi. Et euh, de, de, de remettre la culture au centre des observations de nos parcs. Donc, la culture, euh, il y a une culture urbaine euh, qui, sont, euh, qui, qui se trouve être la, la culture, les savoirs qui sont partagés par tous les citoyens du monde. Euh, les citadins, citadines du monde, par, parce qu'ils partagent un environnement qui est commun euh, dans la densité, dans la rapidité, dans la diversité. <coughs> Certains savoirs sont communs à euh, ceux et celles qui habitent une même ville parce que leur environnement est similaire et leur quotidien est partagé. Il y a aussi une culture qui existe, et c'est ce que je défends, dans les plus petits espaces encore. À l'échelle de quartier, à l'échelle de rue, de ruelles, pourquoi pas, et de parcs. <coughs> les parcs, c'est des magnifiques fenêtres sur la culture, et aux yeux d'une anthropologue, c'est là que réside leur pouvoir. Je vous propose donc de décortiquer la culture sous quatre de ses dimensions, telles que je les ai mises au jour depuis euh, près de 20 ans. De recherche. La première manifestation de la culture dans les parcs, c'est la sociabilité. Et je vais changer ma diapo, pardon. Voilà. <coughs> Excusez-moi. La sociabilité, c'est apprendre à communiquer au sein d'un groupe avec qui on partage les savoirs, les valeurs, les croyances et les mythes. Si je prends l'exemple de la balançoire, euh, imaginons un instant qu'une balançoire est occupée et que vous voulez vous balancer. J'espère que ça vous arrive de vouloir vous balancer. Comment l'indiquer? À taper, comme vous le voyez sur l'image, on se met derrière euh, le ou la balancée et on, on fait la file. À Montréal, on se place à côté, 
le regard un, un, un peu lointain pour ne pas être intrusif, mais on reste là immobile. Cette façon de communiquer est culturelle et la maîtriser va nous donner plein d'accès à plein d'échanges non dits dans toutes sortes de contextes et de moments urbains. Je vous partage cette autre image que j'adore absolument et euh, où <coughs> euh, euh, vous comprendrez l'intérêt de présenter ces deux personnages dans une association euh, extrêmement surprenante, voire improbable, euh, mais euh, qui nous parle à nous, nord-américains, et qui parle certainement à M. Panupi, euh, qui parle fortement à, à tous les Angelinos et Angelina présents aujourd'hui, pourquoi pas, euh, mais euh, qui décrit très bien en, 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 en un coup d'œil, on peut comprendre, si on fait partie de ce, de, 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 de ce groupe culturel-là, euh, qu'est-ce qui est possible de, de, dans la sociabilité en, en ce moment. Et certainement que ces deux personnages partagent tout un... un pour être assis ensemble sur le même banc, partage tout un langage commun qui les unit euh, et qui euh, nous rend un peu <rire> mystifiés. Euh, le deuxième point euh, de, de, des manifestations de la culture dans les parcs, c'est les représentations. Dans les parcs se présentent à nos yeux et au monde tous les caractères de notre ville. Aller dans un parc nous permet d'apprendre à reconnaître les autres, ce qu'ils et elles représentent les mythes qui les entourent, à s'associer ou non à ces étrangers et ces étrangères. Pour citer Godin, quelques personnages de, de Godin et de Tremblay, on y voit dans les parcs les hommes habillés de vieux, les coudes râpés, les foules silencieuses qui attendent l'autobus, les amants, les revendeurs de bouteilles vides, les enfants, les princes charmants de la nuit, la grosse femme d'à côté, peut-être. J'ajoute à cette liste de Godin et Tremblay deux figures contemporaines, les tam tameux tam tameuses les pique-niques électroniqueux électroniqueuses pour ne nommer que ces deux-là. Pour que l'opération soit complète, il faut aussi que le parc soit à son image, à, son, à sa propre image, à son image à nous. Je vous donne l'exemple des bains euh, publics taïwanais où j'ai fait des, de la recherche, des observations. <coughs> et les bains euh, populaires qui étaient fréquentés par euh, euh, beaucoup d'employés euh, de l'État retraités, euh, donc des Taïwanais, euh, euh, où les bains représentaient un design euh, plutôt euh, de style chinois, avec des dragons euh, rouges, euh, un, un peu euh, de la musique forte aussi. Euh, et euh, ces, ces usagers disaient que ces bains, l'eau qui venait de ces bains, euh, était très bonne pour euh, tout, toutes les maladies intérieures comme euh, euh, les rhumatismes, euh, les maladies cardiaques, euh, et donc euh, profitait de ces bains-là pour en tirer les bénéfices. À côté, dans le même quartier, il y avait des bains d'inspiration japonaise qui étaient très utilisés euh, par les euh, touristes euh, japonais, entre autres, qui viennent euh, à Taipei, euh, dans un design épuré euh, où tout est euh, bien organisé, la séquence de baignade est, est très précise. Et de ces bains, on disait que l'eau euh, ne servait qu'à à la matière esthétique. Pourtant, on s'entend que l'eau venait de, de la même, du même endroit, c'est exactement la même eau. Ça peut sembler étrange, mais euh, je vous inviterai à discuter avec des gens du club de voile de baie deux Fées un jour pour euh, les entendre sur qu'est-ce qu'ils pensent de l'eau du Saint-Laurent qu'ils fréquentent en voile et aller parler aux pêcheurs et pêcheuses de, de, qui sont sur les quais de pointe aux trembles voir comment ils qualifient l'eau. Et pourtant, c'est la même, c'est le même espace. Donc, il faut que les parcs nous représentent et c'est ce qui fait qu'on on met en scène une, une pratique ou qu'on fréquente certains parcs et, et pas d'autres. Et pas obligé de les fréquenter les parcs pour en avoir une idée de leur représentation. C'est l'extraordinaire pouvoir de notre montagne royale, du Highline et de Central Park, et c'est aussi ce qui a sonné le glas du Square Vigil. Ça prend de longues heures de pratique pour développer une compréhension des représentations des parcs. C'est ce que j'ai fait pour décortiquer les plages australiennes. Et je peux vous dire que c'est possible de décortiquer différentes représentations en jeu, même quand les usagers sont très vêtus, très peu vêtus. Et euh, c'est aussi, il suffit d'un seul événement euh, déclencheur et trois jours pour exprimer dans la violence des conflits entre représentations. Et euh, ça peut prendre place dans les espaces publics et 
je reviendrai sur les conflits un petit peu plus loin, mais je me devais de le mentionner. La troisième manifestation, c'est l'appropriation. Parce que les parcs portent les qualités de ceux et celles qui les fréquentent, mais l'inverse est aussi vrai. Parce que nos identités sociales se présentent au monde parce que l'on projette, mais aussi par les endroits que l'on fréquente. Dites-moi où vous êtes balancé la dernière fois et je vous dirai qui vous êtes. Est-ce que vous êtes balancé à la Place des Arts sur les balançoires musicales? Vous êtes un touriste au centre-ville. Est-ce que vous êtes, euh, vous êtes balancé dans votre quartier avec votre enfant? Alors, vous êtes un parent probablement débordé. Est-ce que vous êtes balancé vendredi dernier à 23 h avec des amis? Alors, vous étiez peut-être une adolescente en cavale. Si vous n'avez pas de balançoire proche de chez vous, alors vous êtes à Montréal en hiver ou vous êtes à l'année dans un quartier défavorisé de Montréal. En fait, fois le rapport de Statistique Canada sur les disparités d'exposition à la verdure paru euh, il y a moins de quelques, semaines, quelques jours et euh, ça va être le sujet du panel qui suit. Je, je laisse ce titre-là, <rire> provocateur s'il en est un, à votre mémoire. Euh, le, le quatrième élément de, de manifestation de la culture des parcs, c'est ce que j'appelle la disruption. Pour moi, la disruption, je réfère à son sens, euh, non pas euh, comment Uber a disrupté le marché des taxis, mais plutôt euh, le sens électrique, euh, comment, euh, euh, quel bouleversement ça crée quand le réseau électrique est ouvert à son maximum. Parce que les conflits qui émergent dans les parcs, les batailles entre les jeunes, les indécences, le mobilier abîmé, sont autant de façons de communiquer avec des outils qui nous sont offerts culturellement et dans le rôle social qu'on nous donne. Parce que les parcs vides ne sont pas sans sens. Ils attendent seulement que des conflits, quant à leur sens, soient résolus. Parce que les fragments de réel, qui sont positifs ou négatifs, qui nous parviennent, sont autant d'occasions de mettre sur pause notre subjectivité. Parce qu'il faut apprendre à interpréter la disruption et la relativiser, la remettre dans son contexte. Et là, j'aurais de long à dire là-dessus, mais parce que les plaintes sur l'hygiène des parcs dans les derniers jours à Montréal en disent long sur la priorité qu'on leur donne. Et là, je ne parle pas de la, la priorité qu'on donne à l'hygiène, mais la priorité qu'on donne aux parcs. Faut-il que tout soit fermé pour qu'on s'y rencontre? Les parcs ne sont pas encore la première option, pas toujours, pas tout le temps. Et ça, c'est une... C'est ce que je pense, qu quelque chose qu'on devrait considérer comme une disruption. Pour toutes ces raisons, le pouvoir des parcs est culturel. <coughs> Comment l'activer alors? D'abord, et je pense que je prêche à des, des convertis, mais s'il y a un message à passer, ce serait de pratiquer les parcs. Aller faire de la pétanque au parc La Lancette, faire un pique-nique au parc Westmont. Aller voir une partie de cricket au parc Jarry. Écouter de la musique au parc. Oh, and uh, visit our parks to listen to some music in parc Jarry. Or uh, look at people play cricket in, uh, uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in downtown. Or, uh, uh, you know, there are some very unique cultural activities that take place, takes place in different Montreal parks. And that ethno-diversity is as important as the ecosystemic service or the value of uh, biodiversity that parks offer us. So it is just as important to realize that potential. We need to understand the values, the beliefs, the myths, and the knowledge that unite the citizens as locals or people who uh, visit a park as well as from a broader perspective and then adapt our parks accordingly. And we must embrace the resulting complexity as well. Parks need to be able to accommodate all kinds of community gatherings, be it Ramadan festivities, youths chilling at 1 a.m., children playing in the mud or riding their crazy carpets, Chinese square dancers, D&D &D nights swinging their swords, or lonely poets just sitting on a bench. 
but we must stop relying on trying to have one park to accommodate everyone at all times and recognize that it is futile to try to have office workers, families, skateboarders, and children rubbing shoulders in the same public hectare. It is on a citywide scale that all these people must be accommodated. We need parks everywhere in every possible variety. I think that we all agree on that here. And we have to diversify facilities and urban furniture and access by both type and quantity. So that every citizen, whatever their needs, age, ethnocultural origin, economic capacity, and ability to move, has the chance to see their culture in action, to learn it, to question it, and to test it. Every citizen should consider going to the park. I'm sorry, Natalie, but there is really a problem with sound. So maybe be careful when you move uh, papers around because it uh, it's uh, very loud. Sorry. Because every citizen can consider going to the park as a real option at the moment that uh, is appropriate for them and at a time where people they identify with are also present. Also, they can reveal themselves to others uh, and to color the public space with their present. And we want that every citizen can craft and test drive their social identity in the real world context, even if it shocks or upsets some people. And so to paraphrase Godin, because when you look out the window at the park, just passing by, you will always catch a glimpse of yourself. Long live Montreal Park Forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathalie. And uh, I will echo one of the participants. What a great presentation. Thank you very much to Mr. Benepi and Nathalie. Let's now maybe share my screen again. So we had two really interesting presentation. Thank you very much to both of our uh, of our presenters. We applaud you even from the comfort of our own couch. Unfortunately, we cannot be together. We started to receive some questions. So I would like to invite everybody who's participating to have a look at the questions and maybe to vote on ones that you would be interested to have answered. And uh, also please specify who you're asking the question for. So again, uh, sorry about uh, the little glitches uh, for <laughs> the interpretation service. We've been working on it and uh, uh, we had uh, some channel difficulties for some reason. Uh, the French interpreter was on the English channel, but now it is all fixed. So we have uh, 40 minutes for those who want to stay with us for a question period. Now I will stop the sharing of my screen to go back to our keynote speakers and uh, start taking questions. So let's go back to better um, gallery mode. Hello again, Adrian and Nathalie, all good. Okay, so let's take some questions. I will start by a question from for Adrian. And the question is in English. So here we go. Just let's make sure interpretation works. We have a first question for you. Um, so, and you can read also the questions in the Q&A section. So uh, how do you navigate a city's legal obligations, security, legal contracts, unions, electoral platforms, et cetera, and partners need for autonomy in order to be able to accomplish concrete actions? That's a, that's a very good question. And it cuts right to the core of how you work at partnerships. And I'm afraid there isn't one answer, but the overall answer is that each side to achieve a win, each side needs to be able to give something up. So historically in cities, the mayor, the parks commissioner or parks director have all the power and they want to hold on to that power. 
And what I learned over 40 years in working in partnership with groups in New York City was that I could gain by giving up some power. So you look at the balance of things that need to be done and say, what can I give up or what would I happily give up and give over to a private group? So for example, early on in the Central Park Conservancy, the city had no gardeners. We had almost no gardeners for thousands of acres of parks. So the Central Park Conservancy said, we'd like to hire some what they called horticultural interns. They weren't official gardeners or young people who could do horticulture. That avoided the whole issue of replacing union workers. So, so you have to look at what are the what are the union rules and make sure that you understand that beforehand. Another example would be the city wasn't maintaining its monuments. So this they said, we'll hire some conservation interns to take care of the statues and monuments in the park. En conservation historique. On n'a pas besoin de tout commencer dès le Say, we'll just do some programming, some movies, movie nights, arts programming, activities for children, and we'll do it under the supervision of the city. And the city will still do all of the important maintenance work and the security. And then you start there, and then you gradually build up and say, well, we could also hire some gardeners who could do some of the higher, some of the more intensive gardening work that this park needs or something like that. So you can gradually build. Again, all of this can be subject to a, a written agreement, which spells out the rights and responsibilities. And again, to emphasize the having the city provide a legal backstop, that is to protect the nonprofit, uh, legally speaking, from lawsuits that could destroy its um, finances and say that if something unfortunate happens to a visitor to the park. They slip and fall, tree branch falls and hits them. They have an injury while playing sports. That's the legal responsibility rests with the city or the state or the county, the provincial government, not with the nonprofit organization. And that's a very important thing. Thank you. Merci, um, Monsieur Benetti. Um, Thank you very much. Now, uh... Let's ask a question to Nathalie Boucher on this question uh, that uh, Claudia Leduc has asked. Would you be able to recommend uh, some writings or something to read for a group of citizens who are in conflict with uh, trying to cohabit with uh, uh, with homeless people and uh, who are uh, who are in conflict on the subject of graffiti. Well, I would have to think about that if you're talking about a written work. Uh, just contact me and I will make sure that I will refer you to something that speaks directly to this issue. What I would uh, in general suggest and this is very simple, is uh, really to try to have a dialogue with their representatives of the two mm, groups. So, of course, uh, homeless people are stigmatized and their representation holds a very heavy connotation. So it's really when we understand all of their codes and the language that they use when we familiarize ourselves with their culture this is when you can really um, deconstruct the negative connotations that the other group could feel the same goes for the people who live in the area and who call the police or try to ostracize these people that could also hold a very negative connotation so maybe uh, one could organize some uh, uh, meetings uh, structured confrontations so that people could talk about uh, what the are concerned about what are their values so that uh, everybody could get to know the other side and uh, start a conversation that could lead in a consensus maybe that could lead uh, to citizens actually participating in a collective art project with uh, uh, with these people very thank you very much for this comment Ms. Boucher, you also talked about the death of uh, the Vigée Square in Montreal. Could you talk a little more about this topic? What do you mean by that? 
Well, is it uh, the link that you were making is the negative connotation? Yes. I. I know that uh, there is an important population of homeless people who uses the square. Do you see a link there? Do you want to talk about that? Yes, there is a link. And I think that the VJ Square is a really uh, good example of a missed opportunity. And maybe Mr. Benepi uh, could uh, compare this to uh, the uh, an equivalent square in the in New York, we really failed in trying to consult the people who were dwelling in uh, VJ Square to try to figure out how they socialize, uh, what are their values, their codes, and we didn't do that. Now, we also need to understand that some populations are linked intrinsically to a park. Everybody has an opinion on Central Park, even if we have, if we never visited it. And it's the same with the VJ Square. A lot of people uh, thought that it was a horrible space, even if they had never been there. And so I think it's important to understand what exactly is the representation in that park. Who is actually the visitor of this park? Who are the dwellers? And uh, we could have... Um, uh, we could have injected a little color in that park to be more representative of its population, and we failed to do that. Okay, thank you. I have a challenge here, uh, trying to send uh, the right questions to the right people. I don't know, Adrian, if you understood our exchanges in French, yes? Okay, I was curious. Uh, in the context of this discussion uh, offered by Madame Vigier, the New York park that uh, would have a similar dynamic to the Vigier Square. Could you name it yeah. and talk well, about I, that? It's a, it's a really, this is an important discussion in every city in the world really now, um, particularly in warm weather cities in California and the, and the Southwest of, of America, where there's no, there, there is no cold winter. Um, and it's an issue that goes way back into the 1960s with the um, writer and sort of urban philosopher Jane Jacobs, Canadian American, who um, lived part of her time in New York City in the West Village and then moved to Toronto. And um, even in those days, so in the 1960s and 70s, she had very important ideas about public space and ending slum clearance and keeping neighborhoods vital through lots of life in the neighborhoods. She, she had some interesting ideas, interesting. Um, she said, for example, certain parks were so overrun with what she called bums, and she used that word bums, it's like in French you say clochard, that you should just give up on them and just turn them over to the bums. So she was very, she was very politically incorrect in our current speaking, but that's how she viewed it. She said, it's just too late. You know, you, there's nothing to be done. So if someone as progressive as Jane Jacobs was saying that in the 1960s, that informed a time when people were leaving cities and saying it's you know we can't do anything about this the crime was also rampant and they used to say you can't stop vandalism and crime in parks or just let the vandals and the criminals have the run of the place and we we later learned that that's not true and in fact it's not a good thing to do it's not good to say the park should be used for something other than a park and in the same way that we fight people putting in a factory or putting in a highway or something else inappropriate a park is also not a living space unless unless it's a camping space. It's not equipped. It doesn't have toilets to stay open all night. It's not safe at night. And in fact, um, it's dangerous for people to live in parks for their own safety. They can be assaulted and robbed and they can be sexually assaulted. So there should be shelters, proper living spaces for homeless people. And a park is not a proper living space. And that, that's been the view in New York City and many other cities, which is Homeless people have every right to be in a park during daytime hours, but it's not a place to live in. It can't be a public toilet. It can't be a bedroom. And I, I think to it's a sad reality that you can't have a clean, safe public space and also have it a place where people live 24 hours a day because it has to be closed and be cleaned and things like that. So that's that may not be a popular view, politically speaking, but it's a reality in terms of 
how you run parks and that it's the city's obligation to provide proper safe shelters and housing for homeless people and not uh, burden the parks with being the shelters because that's not appropriate that's also not appropriate they're not safe they're not clean and they're not organized to be living spaces thank you um uh, so the question, uh, uh, yes, that was uh, not, uh, it was asked to Natalie, but I really wanted to have your opinion. Now we have a few questions that uh, uh, that talk about the, the accountability of citizens. So I would like to hear both of you on that topic. So I will, uh, I will speak slowly. Can you understand me, Mr. Benepi? Is it okay if I ask? Well, uh, in I, I will also say that I'm listening to your excellent translators. Oh, uh, <laughs> great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Marina and Jennifer. All right. So we have a question from uh, uh, partly from Claudia Leduc, uh, but also partly from uh, uh, someone else, uh, Alexandre Baudouin's question. So how can we? Can we count on a uh, an accountability initiatives to really make people responsible for the cleanliness of park? For example, through the Leave No Trace program, is it really a pipe dream for the urban context, or should we always organize these uh, uh, these collective engagements of uh, citizens to do cleanups? Well, I can go ahead. I um, I would say, why don't we ask them? Why don't we ask the citizens what we could do to make people more accountable? So I think the answer would end up being quite simple. Maybe there is just a garbage can missing in a particular spot, or maybe there are other answers that I don't have, but that the citizens could tell me. And uh, maybe it would be worth asking them, uh, specifically asking those who use this space regularly, who observe what's happening on a regular basis. And these are probably also the ones who end up picking up some garbage and who are complaining about uh, a lack of cleanliness. I think that citizens all have an opinion just by uh, the fact that they use this park and uh, each park has a different situation. I think that it would be worth uh, asking them that. Thank you. Adrian? Yeah, um, I think it's important to involve neighbors and residents in occasional cleanups. It could be a special spring cleanup. You, you've had a long winter, the snow has melted and the stuff is left under the snow, the garbage and so on. Or you're getting ready for the, for, for the fall season, you wanna clean up. But I, I do believe very strongly as a former city official that the ultimate responsibility for the safety and basic cleanliness of public spaces rests with the city. That that's why we pay our taxes. And we shouldn't burden citizens, all of whom are busy and have their own jobs in their lives, with having to do basic cleaning up of garbage or cleaning of public toilets. That's a civic responsibility. It's a very basic city civic responsibility. You can't have a successful city unless you remove the garbage, provide clean drinking water. And I would argue that public toilets are essential services. I, I made it very much my business as parks commissioner to say, yes, it's hard to keep public toilets open. And yes, they get vandalized. And yes, it's hard to keep soap and toilet paper. But we had very special inspection programs to make sure there was soap, there was toilet paper. It was clean and not disgusting. And it was open, right? That's the most important thing. These are basic human needs to have a, a clean operating public toilet and everything else. You can't have to go into a restaurant to ask, may I please use your bathroom? When you're with, there with your four-year-old child, you can't say, oh, I'll go home, walk 20 minutes to home to get to the bathroom. So there's some basic things which the city must provide unless it's completely bankrupt. You know, you know, that's what our tax dollars pay for. Now your volunteers should do the planting maybe maybe come in and do some repainting, paint a mural, organize children's programs. But we, it's, it gets very depressing very quickly for volunteers if all they have to do every day is pick up garbage. And I think that that's why we pay civil servants to do that job. And yes, do some volunteer efforts from time to time, but not on a daily basis. Thank you. 
Mais peut-être que là, le défi... Well, maybe in that case, the challenge could be that in some projects, some citizen projects, uh, I, I'm looking here at Rita's question, how do we maintain the implication of citizens uh, on a volunteer basis sometimes? Um, and I would like to read here the question, uh, Rita's question, how do we maintain the implication of uh, the people who are gradually becoming excluded, specifically in the, the case of this question, when uh, some zones uh, gentrify after uh, the uh, introduction of new infrastructure, such as High Line, or in Montreal, uh, we have other examples. So how do we stay involved as a community of citizens? So um, the, the High Line question is a good one. And interestingly, there was not a lot of gentrification as we commonly understand it because the neighborhood was mostly a manufacturing district. So there weren't a lot of people living there in the first place. All the old buildings surrounding the High Line were former factories and warehouses. You had some small residential populations. There's a large affordable housing community there, uh, a city public city housing project, which is still there. What really gentrified was the, the businesses. So instead of having factories and lots of jobs, you had boutiques and um, you know, art galleries. So it was more of a commercial gentrification than a residential gentrification. However, it did change the neighborhood. And what the Highland found they had to do was that the people who lived in the public housing project, largely people of color, felt like this was not their space because it was primarily tourists and really largely speaking, um, European and Asian tourists said, they don't look like us and we, we don't feel at home there. And the activities that we do don't take, don't take place there. So that, it's a very valid concern that you can have an additional to physical gentrification, social gentrification. I think that's something that Natalie knows a lot about. So you must proactively create programming that brings in other people. So I don't know if it's completely successful, but the, um, the Friends of the Highland said we will create special we'll create special evening activities aimed at the residents, the, the the black and Latino residents of the public housing projects to say, come up, this is also your space. You live right, right below. Please come up and enjoy the space for music programming, for arts programming, for dance and for children's programs. So uh, you have to be very careful about the language that your landscape speaks that's, that can feel exclusionary to people and um, make sure that you do not exclude people based on how you design a space and how you program it, that you welcome everybody, even if you have to do it retroactively. Yeah, this is a really rich subject, this question of how... Uh, um, a park could be perceived uh, from a cultural lens and uh, how a, a park could influence the social dynamic. We could just talk about that topic all day. I see that there are a lot of questions, so I will continue taking them. Uh, I would have been very curious to also hear Natalie on this one, but she uh, has other questions waiting for her. So um, we have Stephanie Watt asking Natalie, what methods could allow a decision makers to better know uh, their parks and how could they then uh, have a more diversified offering? You talked about this topic. Could you uh, uh, detail, uh, could you outline some topics that uh, decision makers could use to figure out who their people are? Well, first of all, hello, Stephanie. Thank you for the question. I think The priority here is to really f understand uh, parks and their dwellers. And so you need to go and speak to the people and to go and observe what's going on there. I think that speaking and observing park users is something really essential. Whereas, uh, let's say, organizing a participative uh, creation workshop with some people somewhere in the room. Well, that could be 
interesting for the citizens that are interested by that type of exercise, but the person who's just going to walk their dog in the park maybe is not interested in such a workshop, even if they do have an opinion on the park. So I would say that we should go and really uh, talk to the people in the field. When we interview people, uh, people are going to talk about their expectation, uh, the expectations, uh, and uh, they might also say some things that uh, do not correspond to the what they actually end up doing. So we really need to have a thorough interview. After that, we can work on concept and uh, facilities, and then we could. Uh, you know, redo this series of interview with the users of the park. Did anything change now that we changed the nature of this park, now that we reorganized it? Do you feel that it is uh, uh, more fitting to people's needs? Sometimes we make a change and then we propose a new design and we leave it be for 20 years without really consulting the people who use it. So I think that what's important is really to go talk to the citizens to understand what's happening in a certain neighborhood or a certain city. And you cannot cater to everybody's needs in one and only park. You really need to figure out how to how to respond to everybody's needs in the city. Right. There are so many other questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Benepi. Diana Delaney asks. To sell land zoned green i.e. a golf course to the city for a park at fair price. Uh, this lady representing Les Amis du Parc Middlebrook, a group advocating for a potential urban nature heritage park in Montreal. Uh, so so what I, I missed the first part. What is the question about this proposed sale of the golf course? So how do we convince a real estate developer uh, to sell land uh, zone green as a go golf course? Well, <laughs> the uh, I, I assume the, <clears throat> the problem is the same in Canada and the US, which is Generally speaking, um, you can't tell a private property owner what to do with their private property, except through zoning constraints. So, you know, if you have a piece of property which is zoned for something, you can't build a factory there, say, if it's zoned for residential. <clears throat> um, however, there, there is a big issue across North America, in the United States, Canada, with golf courses, which is that golf is declining in popularity. And you have big tracts of open space, which no longer can succeed commercially. That's particularly true for many, many cities of publicly owned golf courses. And they are now subsidizing, they're paying people to play golf there because it costs so much to maintain and so few people are playing golf. And if you own a private golf course, you want to see the highest rate of return when you sell it. It's hard to convince a private owner to sell something, even at fair market value, let alone to just simply donate it or give it for, for a low amount of money to the city. And this, again, I'd say is where the city and public authorities can step in. I assume it's the same in Canada, <clears throat> but in the United States, there's something called eminent domain, which means that the city, the government, the federal government, state government say, we're going to take your land. We're going to take your land, Mr. Private Property Owner, and we're going to put it to another purpose. That's been done for well over a hundred years for railroads, for shipping, for housing, for all kinds of purposes, this use of eminent domain where the city takes the land and pays you a fair market value. And sometimes there's a court case to decide what is fair market value. But there have been many parks created in New York City using eminent domain. People, people see eminent domain as an evil thing. It's actually been used for very important public purposes, for water supply, for sanitation, for, all, for schools. Many schools were built by taking someone else's property and paying them for it. In this instance, the best solution would be for the government to say to the golf course owner, we're going to buy it from you, we're going to pay fair market value, and we're going to turn it into a park. Now, of course, the government has to have the money to buy the property, which is a lot of money, and to develop it into a park. But the first thing to do is to buy it, because they won't get a second chance. Buy it, and they don't have to develop it, right? Buy it and hold it. Nature, let nature just do its thing for a while as you find the money and gradually develop it into a park. Uh, and the, one of the justifications for buying this land would be to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Even in Montreal, it's going to get warmer. Montreal is going to get warmer due to climate change. 
is going to have more frequent rainstorms. And you need a place to, if everything is paved over, you need a place to capture the stormwater runoff to act as the lungs of the city to absorb the carbon and to uh, reduce the urban heat island impact. So you could make a justification for using climate change mitigation dollars, environmental dollars and public health dollars to buy this land, hold it, gradually develop it, have a master plan and say, let's have it at the very least play an environmental role while we plan for its future. You don't have to have all the money to develop it, but you do have to ha have the money to save it before it's developed. <laughs> right. Right, to prevent instead of fixing. Now I see big comments in the chat window. Uh, thank you very much for this answer. I hope that it, uh, it gives uh, our friends at Middlebrook some uh, solutions. They've been very active on that front for a while now. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Benepe. Now. Uh, let's uh, look at a question by Michel Lafleur. Uh, he will actually be one of the speakers tomorrow. So he's asking Nathalie, how can we create this ethno-diverse uh, network of parks to really optimize the synergies and the complementarity of different parks? Is it just uh, done naturally or do you need a master plan? How do you see that? That's a great question. I think that um, I maybe woke up a beast uh, by mentioning this uh, ethno-diverse uh, uh, value. I think that it's important to recognize the informal practices that normalize parks or that uh, are a characteristic of parks. I don't know if it's really helpful to formalize them, to write them down in documents or some master plans. But I think that we should certainly develop the expertise within the cities and within uh, neighborhoods to integrate these notions. And I think that it should be known, it should be learned that you could uh, say in uh, a certain area that uh, a, a group of users of the park, and here I'm thinking about an example in particular from the recent time, we have a lot of Muslim uh, population in our neighborhood, and it's important to have uh, equipment to for them to be able to celebrate Ramadan, and it should be accepted, and it should be embraced. What does it mean for other users of the park? How do we frame this? And there are there is a rotation of practices and appropriation in parks. So that is an example, the Muslim community celebration. This is a very obvious example of culture that you can see materialize in the parks, but there are others as well. I think that as soon as you institutionalize cultural practices, you can already see alternative practices spring up. And uh, we must be careful about segregation in that case. I worked a lot in Australia, in the pools, and in the pools, uh, you you have indications that are written in the lanes how long you can uh, how long it should take you to complete a lap and so could you then uh, tell somebody you're not fast enough you're not strong enough you're old enough um, and yeah because it is formal the wooden principle be able to do that. So I think that we should have a set of informal practices and accept that we can't necessarily fund these things specifically or put them on paper, but we need to recognize them as a value uh, as we plan and manage parks. That is a great question. That is a big question. This whole concept of uh, ethno-diversity and uh, we hear about this a lot in all kinds of discussions. Now, questions for you. Ellen uh, from Ami de la Montagne. ...between the city administration and the community, including the private funders. 
that led to the rise of the conservancy and friends of model that seems to work so well for parks in the States. Can you just repeat the question? I was, it was caught between the translators. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, this, and sorry yeah. for the interpretation. Yeah. No, no, it was, it was just, it started okay. out and then I, so I missed the first part. So just please repeat. Okay. That. So what was the driving force behind the new balance of responsibilities between the city administration and the community, including the private funders that led to the rise of the conservancy and friends of model that seems to work so well for parks in the States? It was, it was simply that the um, in city after city, but particularly in New York, um, the city had failed in its responsibilities and allowed the parks to decline very badly. And this was from the 1950s through the 60s and 70s, so that we, you know, New York City, as you may recall, almost went bankrupt in the 1970s. And Unfortunately, in many cities, when they have financial problems, the first thing they cut is the parks department because they think that's a luxury. You don't you don't really need parks. You need police. You need fire. You need sanitation. The parks are a luxury. You know we don't. So um, and that was the case that as cities were becoming impoverished, parks declined across America. They were in New York City, Central Park, Prospect Park, Bryant Park were in serious decline. Uh, there was no grass growing anywhere. The trees were dying. There was graffiti everywhere, heavy crime. So it was the citizens saying, government has failed. We have to act. It was li literally that. And so leading citizens created studies to say we need to invent a new paradigm. And so it was kind of born out of desperation. And then it turned out, you know, they, they do things differently. Uh, they do things better. And that you know, the city despite having responsibility had failed in its major responsibilities to keep the park safe, clean, and well-programmed. Now, the answer for every park is not to have a private group maintaining and running. It, it should be the exception, not the rule. And it's my view and the view of most parks advocates that the lion's share of the care and programming of parks should be taken on by government authorities, city, state, federal, provincial, whatever it might be. And that, um, only where there's added value to having a partnership or particularly in downtown small squares where you might have a business improvement district where they can do a much better job than the city in terms of bringing the necessary programming to activate the space. But it's, it's not a panacea. It's not the solution for every park. Um, the vast majority of parks in New York City do not have a private group caring for them. They're cared for by the New York City Parks Department. And what I, what I think happened was that you had such big improvements in some of these parks that the, the rest of New York said, wait a second, we want better parks in all our neighborhoods, not just Central Park and Prospect Park. And they kind of, it was a, a way to convince the city that you need to raise the standard using public resources for all the parks. And some of the lessons learned about um, zone gardeners, for example, and zone management and other innovative practices were then shared into the public sector. So that the, it became a rising tide that lifted all the boats. So that even the public sector improved because it kind of challenged to do better by the private sector. Mm. Yeah. La, la, je trouve on, on voit quand même ici I think that uh, what we see here is this reality uh, that is very American. Is it really different from the Montreal reality? I think that uh, in the question, we look at people who are very involved in, uh, in groups that uh, talk about parks and uh, they have maybe stronger financial structures and uh, are more organized. There is another person who asked a similar question when we look at New York and we see how well uh, some projects are financed from my private, uh, from private sources. Uh, maybe that's not the ideal every time, but still you could see a dynamic that we in Montreal are looking at and we're wondering, you know, what's going on here in our parks and uh, are pri is private financing present enough? 
I don't know if Nathalie Boucher, you are aware of uh, the funding aspects, but uh, what do you think the investment culture in Montreal of the public investment in the public infrastructures, is it strong? As Mr. Benepi said, uh, there are some services that are considered essential services that should be funded by the city. But if our park budgets are limited on the city side, uh, how would you see the Montreal culture in terms of, inter of a private financial commitment? Well, I'm not sure about the finances, but uh, I think that the Montreal park culture is still waiting to be defined. I think that uh, the American way of life in parks uh, is different from our, I don't know, French culture, I guess. Um, they have more of maybe of a hands-on approach and um, to just jump in and do uh, and do things in the park. And this is all due respect with the public uh, participation in the American culture. I think that the French culture has another dynamic that is more based on uh, negotiation consensus. This is what should be done. This is what I'm doing. And there's this uh, triangle when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, trying to save public spaces and uh, uh, plead with the city that we should save a certain green space. Maybe we are a little shocked in a good way by what the Americans are doing. Maybe we should find our own way of doing things. And it's not because we don't use public private partnerships that we don't have any leverage or any good opportunities for public life in the parks. We just have a different way of doing things and we should respect that this is our culture this is our life and this is our friend francophone uh, uh you know personality well actually i thought i think that this uh, would conclude this session perfectly we could obviously continue for a long time but i think that it really reflects the exchanges that we had with uh, mr benepi and madame boucher this whole question about uh, you know the role of the parks as windows and mirrors of our culture and they should represent their users there's this balance to be found between trying to plan them and zone them and uh, manage them and uh, leaving them be as mirrors of the culture i so i would like to really thank you for your time for your participation and we have <laughs> this list of questions that is uh, continuing to grow but i'm really happy that we took the time to answer the ones that we did and uh, thanks again to everybody our keynote speakers and this was recorded so we are going to share this i will share my screen for a last time to finish this presentation i just wanted to tell you that the question that you've asked they will uh, certainly go uh, be considered by our uh, our network we're going to think about them we're going to use them to plan our next activities and now uh, tomorrow we are going to have our second activity so those who will continue uh, with us uh, will uh, enjoy a discussion panel on equity and environmental justice in Montreal in the company of Jerome Duprat, Lourdes Nijan, Anne Pelletier, and Michel Lafleur. And the discussion panel will be moderated by Carol Mayrand. That is tomorrow noon. Please uh, register, and we are going to share the links to register in the chat. Otherwise, tomorrow at 5 p.m., uh, we will have our last activity, the online after work. So it will be your turn to uh, show up with a little glass of uh, something and uh, to continue discussing all kinds of issues that we've discussed today during our discussions. How do we engage? How do we uh, stay accountable? 
in activating the power of the parks at all levels of involvement. And so tomorrow we are going to continue discussing this, uh, the solution, the solutions to this uh, issue of uh, engagement. Again, uh, we shared the link in the chat. And finally, please follow us online. You can uh, uh, follow the activities of the network in the next few years. There are a lot of activities that are coming up and uh, we invite you to follow us on social media. And you can also follow our four partners, the members of the network. You have the Amidi Park, Ami de la Montagne, uh, the Centre d'écologie urbaine de Montréal, and the Cray of Montreal. So again, thank you so much to everybody. Thanks to the speakers, to those who asked questions. This was amazing. We were uh, over 120 people listening in today. And for those who survived, uh, we are still um, all together. It was great seeing you. And uh, we can't wait to see you again. Have a great spring.